Braincast, der Schulfunk zum Gehirn. So, welcome Dan, it's a pleasure to meet you in person after having lots of fun with your books. Thank you very much, nice to be here. Your second book, um, The Upside of Irrationality, is being published these days in Germany. It's called Fühlen nützt nichts, hilft aber. It's a lot of fun to read and it's full of insights, but it's serious science, what you're doing there. It's called behavioral economics. So to get an impression on that and on your point of view, what, ha what does um, the behavior of rats and bankers have in common? <laughs> or, or not to be racist and surgeons? <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> First of all, let me just say a word about behavioral economics. Yeah. You know, so, um, behavioral economics is, is really um, kind of a combination of lots of social science that is empirically in nature. And it's kind of attacking economics um, for two reasons. One, because economics has become so uh, big part of our lives in terms of decision-making, businesses and policy, that it's good to realize where economic fails and where reality starts. But, but the second thing that is more important is that it's a, it's a study that kind of shows us how our intuitions fail. And I think we often have this, uh, this great gut feeling about what's the right, the right thing to do. And it turns out our gut feelings are just gut feelings. They're often not, not correct. And it's really good to keep in mind how often it is that we're failing and to think about how we test our intuitions more, more generally. And The question about bankers is one, <laughs> is one example for this. So, you know, in this country, like in the U.S., uh, bankers are getting paid lots of money. Uh, they're getting paid much of it in bonuses. And at the end of the day, uh, it's the shareholders of the company who are paying their salaries. So it's not as if it's their own money, you know, which they can pay themselves as much as they want. It's, it's shareholders' money. And the question is, is this an efficient way to pay people? And there's lots of reasons to give people bonuses, but one of them is to the idea that if you make people really want to achieve something, they'll be successful. And the question is, is this, is this the case? And it turns out it's partially the case. It turns out that as long as we deal with simple mechanical things, more money means better performance. Mm -hmm. So imagine I asked you to jump, and I gave you a jumping bonus of either one euro per jump, or a thousand euro per jump. You will jump more as the bonus gets, gets higher. And people predict that, and that's indeed the case. But what happens when the tasks require thought, and memory, and creativity, and concentration, all of those highly cognitive skills? It turns out that here too, people think that more bonuses will yield higher performance, but here the results are actually opposite. And that's the case when we actually behave much like rats. And, and the idea is that incentives or money is a two-edged sword. It makes us want to perform very well, but it also stresses us. And sometimes the stress can overwhelm performance. So, for example, if I told you that if you'll be funny in the next 10 minutes, really, really funny, I'll give you 10,000 euros, how much of your next 10 minutes would you be able to think about all the jokes you know and what's the funniest of them uh, compared to how much stressed uh, you, you would be. And it turns out that very easily str stress overwhelms it. Another way to think about it is imagine your job and imagine there was like a hundred percent motivation. And even without bonus you have a high motivation, right? You can think to yourself how much are you on this from a hundred percent. And now the end of the motivation, what's missing, you could say you could make up with a bonus could get you to do percent but but if the bonus overshoots and become too big now you'll start thinking about it all the time you'll be wondering am i making my bonus is this good enough is this and as a consequence you're not going to to perform as well and and, and you know in the last kind of a couple of years i've been going to lots of bankers and talking to them about this and, 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 and uh, sorry and they did listen to you They listen, but they don't, they don't agree with me, right? Because, you know, they get paid so much money not to agree. But so bankers say, we know, we never get stress. You have no money in the world that would stress us. And <clears throat> it's hard to say. I mean, I'm inviting them to come to the lab and being tested. Uh -huh. they, they, never, they never show up. But, 
But they all agree to the following. They all say that for the last three or four months of the year, every day they go to their desk, they open an Excel spreadsheet, and they calculate how much bonus they will make this year. So if nothing else, even if not stressed, they agree that they spend lots of time on it. Because imagine that you could get paid lots and lots of money and 80% of it was unknown, 80% of it was in a bonus. Wouldn't you be occupied a big part of the day, every day, with this thought about, you know, will you make this big pot of money or not? It's kind of interesting, right, that we want people to go to a particular goal and we give them lots of money. We say, naturally, you're not going to do it, so we'll give you lots of money. But what the money does is to make you think about the money <laughs> and not necessarily the, the end the end goal. So it's a really strange idea about incentive if you think about it. Don't they get used to that high numbers? And this is their reasoning, is it? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, first of all, it's not clear that they get used to it, you know. Um, now, people get used to stuff at the end of the day, uh, but how much, how much time will you need to get used to stuff? It's not clear that a yearly bonus for 10 or 20 years is a lot of repeated experiment, repeated experience, because the fact is, they still seem to be consumed by it every year. And, and in some way, I think societies make it worse, because we tell bankers that the only thing we value about them is how much money they get. And we make lists in the newspaper that says how much money they get, and they compare it with their friends. So they become obsessed about it beyond the financial Aspect. So even people who might be sufficiently wealthy and don't have to worry about it still worry about it because we as a society have put so much value on this as a measure of their self-worth. Mm -hmm. right? So it's, you can think of it as, actually a big, big part of this book is, is the idea that if we, if we wrote an equation of what predicts motivation, like you have a Y variable that predicts motivation, then you have lots of X variables, and one of them would be salary and bonus and meaning and all kinds of other variables. The question is, what are all these variables that are, are in this equation? And I think for bankers, one of the things we've done is we've taken lots of those other variables and replaced them with money. Okay. So, you know, it, you can think about where do you find meaning at work? What do you mm -hmm. find satisfying? Right? It could be maybe about creating an interesting website or coming up with something clever, or having your name associated with something that people... There's lots of other things that you value. For bankers, we've replaced all of those with money. So, so in some sense, we are making it worse. Okay, and where do the rats come in? Okay, so this is one of the, the earliest experiments in, in psychology over 100 years old in which they took a couple of rats and they measure what is the relationship between the amount of electrical shock that they get, which is an incentive. Actually, the incentive is to avoid electrical shock. Okay. <laughs> and how fast the rats were learning. So imagine you're a rat, you're in a maze, and some areas of the maze are safe and some are dangerous. And every day you need to figure out which one are safe and which one are dangerous. And there are different hints in the environment. One day the safe could be white and dangerous can be black. One day it could be a different color, stripes, all kinds of things like it. And you have to figure it out. And now the question is, how will your speed of learning be a function of the electrical shock? Mm -hmm. Now, when the electrical shock is very mild, you don't care. Learning is very slow. As the electrical shock gets bigger, you want to learn faster and you learn faster and faster and faster. But at some point, the shock becomes so strong that it actually reverses. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you can think about it. Imagine you were walking in Berlin. Imagine you didn't know the city. And imagine that some areas were safe and some were dangerous and you were getting electrical shock, depending on it. You can imagine that at some point the electrical shock will be so powerful it will just take your breath away. Mm. That from time to time you'd make a wrong turn and you just kind of get this amazing shock. And under those conditions and this level of fear, would you be able to focus or would be totally consumed? Mm -hmm with the shock. And the same thing happens to bankers when they become totally consumed with the financial reward. They just think about that. They don't think about their own performance actually as much. I see. You already talked about standard economics. This is something you get Nobel prizes for. Standard economics is very straight ahead telling us how, how explaining us the behavior of markets and the behavior of market players. Yeah. Um, 
we are rational beings, we are rational creatures, and we always decide in our most interest. Yes. And this this is completely um, compatible with Darwin's evolution. So, not, not necessarily. No? There, there, no? Are some, there are some interesting differences between Darwinism because, uh, first of all, um, the theory of evolution has no assumptions about what people try to optimize. The survival? Yeah, the survival, but it doesn't have to be... It's about the gene, it's, it's not about selfish maximization, which is, which is a different story. And, and also, in, in Darwin, there is elements of caring about others, mm -hmm. which is not yeah. so present in standard economics. Yeah. Now, in, in evolutionary uh, theory, you're caring about others is proportional to the market structure and to how much of your genes they are sharing. Whereas in standard economics, there isn't okay. anything yeah. like that. But, but there are definitely similarities. Okay, the question was, um, behavioral economics is not that straight. It's kind of fuzzy. Yes. And there's way too much fun in it to be a serious science. So what, does your, what do your classical colleagues think about behavioral economics? Yeah, so first of all, let me tell you what I think about them. <laughs> um, look, the reality is that I like standard economics. I think it's a beautiful, elegant, interesting theories with some prediction power. Right? So if you look at economics, you wouldn't say it's 100% wrong, right? It's yeah. X percent right. How much is the X percent? Is it 20%, 30%? I mean, you, you can decide for yourself how much you think it's right. And, and I think the cardinal sin of economics is not that economics is wrong, but that, the, uh, but that the economists have pretended it's more right than it really is. Mm -hmm. right? so, so think about what the message is from economics when you read the introduction to economics. It says, here's a theory, it explains human behavior, it explains perfectly human behavior, and you don't need anything else. And you can take this theory, and you can build public policy, and you can build companies, and you can build regulation, you can build markets <laughs> based on that. And that, I think, is the problem. Mm. And when you talk to people who have PhDs in economics and have studied for a long time and are not in the University of Chicago, they all realize that economics is much more restrictive than that. It doesn't explain 100% of the variance, it explains some of the variance. But the problem is that it's so tempting to say, here's a theory that explains some things, let's not assume it explains more. Um, that, I think, is the big, is the big problem. Now, what, what do economists think about uh, behavioral eco economics. Um, so I think that first of all they are uh, uncomfortable with the type of uh, messiness of behavioral theory. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you think about it, um, one of the main criticisms is that there's not a single theory of behavioral economics. Behavioral economics right now it's a, it's a set of things we don't do well. And they're not all connected into one, mm -hmm. one big theory. And economists kind of are upset with that because there's not a single theory. It's hard to figure out where things, where things are. And in some th sense, I think they're right. It's a shame we don't have a single theory. But I don't think we ever will have a single theory. So you're becoming an expert in vision. Uh, you know, there's lots of theories of vision. <laughs> There's actually lots of mechanisms of vision. Yeah. We do different vision in the middle, in the retina. <laughs> we do different uh, vision in the, in the fovea. We do different vision for night, different vision for movement. I mean, we have different mechanisms for color. Even for something as simple, you know, relatively speaking, as vision, we have many, many mechanisms. We don't have a single theory that explains all of vision. We have different mechanisms that explains different parts of vision. So now you can ask yourself, could we have a single mechanism would explain all of human economic behavior? Very unlikely, right? We're not evolutionary designed to do economics or to, mm -hmm. to do this. And we basically co-op different mechanisms we have for, for dealing with this complexity. 